Okay, hello. <laughs> this was a surprise to most of us, by the way, so we're, we're sort of, um, getting our heads together. So here's a question. We talk about business agility a lot, and we talk about the challenges that organizations face. The question, and I want you, is in an Indian context, in a, in a, in a cultural diverse country like India, what are the cultural challenges? Well, what are the cultural challenges that we face by adopting any sort of business agility? From your experience, it doesn't even have to be India, it could be America. Cultural challenges. Right, you want me to, you want me to you raise your hand? I think Todd wants to say something. Oh, no, I don't really want to say anything, but well, but I'll, I'll start. I've, dealt, I've been working uh, in the Indian culture for quite a number of years, um, and, and uh, uh, one of the things I think the biggest challenge that I've had working with, with teams, um, you know, we have the standard remote challenges and all of that, but um, I think the biggest challenge I've had is the one, there is a cultural element of not wanting to disagree um, with when someone says something. And, and that's probably the biggest thing I've challenged with, with working with Indian teams compared to working with teams from Eastern Europe or, or um, elsewhere, is that I, in, I expect challenges from from everyone, and when I don't get that, when everyone everything is a yes, 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 um, and then things don't get followed through, then that's a big challenge. So that's one of the biggest challenges is that engagement and the challenge. That's really how we build collaboration. That's really how we build business agility uh, across the board. Is we have to have an engagement across the organizations and across, working as partners. And that's about probably the biggest challenge I've had working with with uh, teams in India. So the million dollar question: How do you how do you shift a cultural behavior, organizational culture or societal culture? I, yeah, and, and the, what I have found is that the only way I've been able to, so what I've found is I have to work individually I find them willing to challenge all the time. It's sort of this in you know, a business relationship where it starts to be uh, work differently, and so you have to change that rigid business relationship towards more of an individual relationship, and then I start seeing that that change. So that's that's how it's worked for me. So, so he's saying small steps, and that's how you would change anything. You change a culture, uh, an organization, a team, a, a, a country, you would say, yeah, s let's do small things. And if you want to see behavior change in individuals, you'd begin by modeling it and rewarding it. So I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> because you had a question. Right? Naresh has something to disagree with. What a surprise. <laughs> I had a counterpoint to Todd, and hence I thought I should take the stage. Uh, I think, again, this is a classic stereotyping thing that I have worked with Indians and hence all Indians are like this. I'm not... <laughs> uh, the, the problem is that often a lot of people outside India have worked mostly with services companies and in services company this is the way you make business. Uh, you're told not to say no, right? But if you work with the product companies here, they're very different. We have like fist fight and we have like real fights and people <laughs> disagree all the time. And you know that, so I think the point I'm trying to make is company culture actually uh, supersedes the, the original culture. And so, you know, if you're in a, if, if you're in a setup like a services company, then that culture is basically which encourages people not to disagree. But a product company or a startup company, there is a very strong culture of disagreeing. So that was only my point. So, so no, sit, sit back down. How do you, ch so if you have an existing company culture, how do you shift it? So you, if you have an existing company culture, how do you shift it? Yeah. What What is the reason for shifting? That's a good. You're not meant to ask me questions. <laughs> I'm going to be asking you questions. Uh, in general, because an organisation decides they want to have more agility, right? And perhaps it's mandated. Perhaps it's decided through a retrospective or some other communal mechanism. But the culture of an organisation is generally not necessarily the one that is needed in the future and there has to be an evolution. So the reason I asked you w w why it's required is because if you see as an industry we have thrived, uh -huh. the IT industry here. And the reason we've thrived is because we are very adaptable. 
Agile came along, we said, great, we will be Agile. You know, whether you're actually or not doesn't matter. But, you know, this is very adaptive. Before that was CMM, CMMI, we, we went through that craze, right? So I think people here, in my experience, are very adaptive and they, they, they thrive on that. And that's why if you see last 20 years, the industry has grown significantly. So the, the question was like, why do we need to change? We, we're already thriving. Was your question uh, a general question, how you shift company culture, or was it related to India now? No, it's a general question, how do you shift company culture? Because uh, for me, one, um, the most system relevant people in a company usually are the leaders in a company. And the leadership behavior will uh, manifest itself in, in the company culture much more than uh, the behavior of an individual person. So uh, in my experience at least, such a shift needs to come from the leaders. It needs to be lived by the leaders. So that's at least for me one part, a very important part of shifting a company culture. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'd like to challenge your first question before I respond to the second. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, culture is not our main challenge. I think it very often is used as an excuse, right? I think the main challenge here is the whole, the, the whole management industry out there and the business schools and the universities that has produced these kind of mindsets over so many years and all the people that they have in the organizations uh, around now. That, that is our main challenge, the, the mindset. And uh, when it comes to changing company culture, I think that you need to look at, look at the interplay between management processes and culture. You can, you can, you can change your culture by changing your management processes um, in the right direction and in the wrong direction. And too often, I mean, this is seen as kind of two separate things, but culture is over here and that's HR, <laughs> management processes is over here, that's finance, and no wonder it goes wrong. So uh, I would like to challenge that part of uh, uh, when Naresh said uh, that we are adaptive. Uh, I feel that uh, uh, based on my experience with some of the team members, it's like you know, some uh, if you have thought of one idea, then you are so stick to that that you feel that you know this is right. And even whosoever you know uh, gives a uh, reciprocating or. Uh, anything which is ma even making sense, but then still people say, yeah, this is good, but then my idea is the best one. So I feel that the still people have that kind of, you know, non-adaptive nature. A, a fixed mindset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not an Indian problem, yeah, it's a universal thing. And I, I liked what, what you said, and then we think, actually, human beings are ticking very uh, similarly. And of course, we have cultural small differences, but overall, we are driven by sim very similar things. Uh, so you talked about changing management, and uh, one of the viewpoints I have is changing structure which is not necessarily management, but changing structure can influence the way people behave. And you can call that as the culture of the company now, but if you change the structure, then it, it can lead to uh, changes in, in, in the way people behave. But is the, the, the structure um, uh, shaping the culture, or is culture shaping the structure? So th this is a bit of a hen and an egg thing, I think. And um, sometimes the, the thinking, the mindset of people um, will result in different structures. So. Yeah, but can you change mindset by changing a structure? Maybe, but it needs to be a, a, a clever move then. Well, they, they do say that structure reflects process. It's, that's a bit oversimplified considering the complex adaptive nature of our organizations. Making a single intrusive change structure, any single change is going to distort, but not truly enable you know, is sustainable change. You have to make a holistic change kind of in slices through behavior. Uh, clearly the leaders have to demonstrate the behavior, but when you really think about it, it's the behavior of the people in the organization that's going to have the strongest influence, consistent behavior in that. So uh, let the, me the, pause that, because I, I want to touch, you talk about persistent change, and, and I want to I want to explore that slightly. In your experience, this is an open question for everyone. In your experience, what have been the smallest changes that you have seen made in an organization that have had the biggest ripple effect in terms of agility and, and, and transformation? You can start. Sorry, you 
the, the biggest change that, that we've seen um, in large organizational transformational change is to hold all managers accountable to being agile leaders at all levels and developing an environment where everyone thrives, where the managers actually own the transformation as opposed to being sort of, you know, uh, frozen middle type behavior. And when they own it and they start to really role model, as you were saying, role modeling the right agile leadership behavior, Everyone thrives at a level that's phenomenal, and it's a very subtle leader, little change. Also introducing then leadership circles to support that change. Then they take on the big rocks of changing finance systems or HR or anything else. So it's a subtle change with dramatic results because it is holistic. It's not just the structure. The structures will fall away when the organizations are self-organizing and they replace them, as opposed to just attacking the structure, which is going to get all kinds of resistance and friction. And a bit related to what Beata sometimes says, it's always a recruitment problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, had, uh, we had done experiments with just changing the recruitment criteria, especially for leaders. So looking really for, can we see agile mindset in the candidate uh, that is applying for a position, makes a huge change. So the, the example you gave really fits nicely into why I came up here. So for me, culture is expressed by behavior and habits of everyone in the organization. And behavior and habits are driven, as I see it, by, well, on the one hand, the thing that we have talked about, structure. On the other, about from the strategy, and the third thing uh, is the processes, and um, which is really a triangle. And there, you you can find also a lot of studies where they say, well, structure follows process, but there are also studies saying process follows structure, and the same is true with strategy. So they are all interwoven, and as soon as you you get started, there somewhere you change the behaviors and the habits and your example was exactly that so it was like starting at that uh, for this thing i think it was more the process so how the management did stuff also your recruitment was a process thing process thing which changed behaviors and habits and therefore the culture so that's yeah. yeah and here i would like to put forward the context the indian context where we initiated this discussion it's not about the demographic differences i am with narish on that it's based on many aspects it can be services it can be product development and more on on the top of culture is based on the structure on top of a structure is a process on top of process is a meta process but when we are targeting about the culture, culture aspect of it, and when we are talking the Indian context, is more of the values and the principle on which that culture is surviving. Uh -huh. So the change on the value and the principle is very important. And when your culture shifted from structure to process to meta process and comes into the practices, and if your values and principle are not mapped along with the culture, with the practices you are doing it's not reflecting there so it's all about what all practices you're following inside the organization whether it's matching with your values and principles and whether it's getting reflected with the culture aspects of that so root the dna part of it is the value and the principle okay so i agree that uh, behaviors are shaping the culture yes but what is shaping behaviors really that is the values and the needs the basic desires of people people personalities right that is shaping uh, behaviors so if you don't hire the people with the right values uh, in an agile organization it will never be agile right because you can fake behaviors but not for long uh, you will always hit a kind of a wall when you fake behaviors too long. So, um, so you I need to have that right value structure in people from yeah. the beginning. I want to disagree. Go for it. And I disagree with Chess Humboldt's words. So these are not mine, but I like them very much. So he said, if you have a broken system and you hire the right people, you will not fix the system, you will break the people. And 
vice versa. So yeah, I agree I with you. With chess. <laughs> it's not enough to hire the right people. Uh, the the organization's value structure needs to be agile, right? And then you need to have people who adhere to that value structure. And it's not enough to hire new people into the wrong value structure. So, so. I, I just want to touch on a topic that a few of you have mentioned. And you're talking about values, and one of the key values of business agility is the customer. Right? The customer is at the heart of much of what we do. How, how do you... But what advice or suggestions do you have to bring the customer closer into the engagement, closer into the organization, and build that customer centricity that many organizations lack, I'm afraid? First and foremost, go and meet your customers. Get the people who are in the value chain to actually go and spend time in the closest point in, the, in your organization where you touch a customer. So in a software development environment, get the software engineers answering help desk calls. Just build empathy through feeling their pain. So who out here has actually sat on a help desk and listened to the customer complaints? A couple of you. All right. Now, I've got a great story of sending uh, software and hardware engineers in who were designing products for farmers. And we sent them out into the cow shed. And the, the, the one engineer was holding a prototype device that was intended to be used by farmers in the cow shed. And in the, in the cow shed, in the milking shed, he was walking along and behind, there was a cow's backside there. Cow lifted its tail and let go. And the device failed. <laughs> it uh, didn't survive being covered in uh, three to five liters of cow manure. So was the programmer covered in the <laughs> three to five liters of cow manure. And uh, that really gave him empathy for what his customer is going to need to deal with and likewise the, um, what the device will have to deal with in the real world. And that was the first time he'd ever been on a farm. <laughs> You're going to disagree. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, so often I hear examples like this, and I think these are kind of weird one-off examples uh, in my experience. Uh, because you're giving an example of you know someone who went to a cow shed, didn't have any experience of being there, and accidentally happened, mm -hmm. right? may not happen to the guy who's always there because he learned the lesson. So maybe that empathy of this may not be required in the product, right? In this specific case, I'm just trying to highlight that. Uh, similarly, uh, I, uh, you know, I've worked enough for really successful startup founders, and their philosophy is customers are idiots, don't listen to them. Usually, the most noisiest customers are the most useless customers. And the ones who are really important are ones busy doing stuff, uh, yeah. right? So there, I'm just trying to pray the devil's advocate, yeah. saying uh, there's yeah. the flip side of it, that we need to be careful, uh, because a lot of times people go all out. So, so my, my intent, my story is build empathy, not necessarily uh, the specific example. And yeah, the, the Henry Ford quote comes to mind all the, all the time. It's a self-correcting engine, not for the, hair, hair, you know, the the Ford analogy there. But if you don't respond to your customers, you're not going to survive. And I can remember uh, back when I was at Intel, we had a defect. It was called FDiv. If anyone has ever heard of that, FDiv as a um, sort of a corporate revelation, because our CEO at the time said, "This is something we don't need to fix." And he said this ended the social media sphere back then. And it ended, every analyst came after us where we actually as a company put everyone on the support line to do the recalls. And it was several million dollars at the time of this recall. And I can remember two years ago, this was like eight years after FDiv, the, 
the paradigm shift that was created by that one defect was still floating around and everyone would go, oh, we don't want another F div. And people were educating this story, this myth now to most of the millennials who were in the organization, they were still perpetuating that myth that, that us as a company, we cannot be that again. So that also brings up process is created when someone stuffs up and the answer, let's never let that happen again. So we add more process. Right? So I'm not saying that's what happened in this case. How do you make it such that in an organization when a failure like that occurs, it is both a learning experience but it's also treated as a uh, it, it, is, it does not change, it does not reduce the agility of the organization. I, I think it actually, the crisis actually created the agility. One of the, one of the, one of the comments I make to most people who are adopting Agile is that w when are you most, you have, when do you have the most speed and the most efficiency? Typically is when you go into a task force mode. And I ask, especially the bigger companies, well, why don't you just behave that way all the time? Treat everything with that same level of urgency that you would if you were to go create a task force versus I can be complacent for some period of time and then other periods of time I, when the crisis hits, I'm going to have to go jump around and do stuff. I think all companies uh, are pretty good in crisis mode, at least that's something I've observed. Um, because in crisis mode usually what's happening is a lot of the constraints that are usually prohibiting the organization system to respond properly to a customer, they are gone and all of a sudden everybody can do exactly what's right. Uh, and and that's, that's why we sometimes uh, say uh, a bit in a joke we should be constantly in a crisis mode because then uh, we would just do what's right. Um, so why can't but it's really not sustainable for people to be in a crisis mode all the time. Yeah. It's, you know, <laughs> adds a lot of stress, I guess. So how do you get the agility of a crisis mode without the, the, the stress of a crisis mode? You make sure you've got the right feedback loops in place and ultimately you're measuring the things that matter and that is really make visible the cost of excess process to the point of really looking at value divided by that cost so that you expose it and then enable organizational teams to address it, right? But it's that it's that invisibility that kills you when that process just keeps growing and growing. If you don't have those radical feedback loops in place to expose those. It's feedback loops and communication, communication, communication. And that is also, I mean, uh, I would not subscribe to that, that all customers are stupid or whatever. I think we should always listen to the customer and communicate with the customer. It doesn't necessarily mean we do all the things that the customer Ask us to do. Yeah, we need to have to be sparring partners. In that sense, I think, in the age of agile, um, we are not like having a customer-supplier relationship. It's more like partnership uh, kind of of attitude that we the, need to the develop. Co-creation. Co-creation. So, I, I still think we got to be careful with that because we're in business for those customers. The reason why we are in business is because they come to us and buy things. I remember back in the 19, it was, I think it was in the 1980s, I spent a lot of time in Japan, and we, from our Western lens, we were always trying to paint this as a partnership. But from their perspective is, no, you are a vendor, and we do have our needs, and we need these needs met, versus, you know, let's go into some cooperative mode to go work together. It was just, it, w it wasn't sustainable from the aspect that we do have an intertanglement between our success and their success. But we're, we're, we live in such a competitive world today that if we're not satisfying those companies, they're going to go find somebody else who will. For, for me, uh, I agree partly to you and I partly disagree with you because I think that really depends on what kind of thing you are talking about. If it's a bit of a legacy product or a commodity thing, I'm absolutely with you. When it comes to innovation and uh, when you have a lot of uncertainty involved, then co-creation, I think, is the much stronger concept. All right, so we're almost out of time. I think dinner is going to be outside fairly shortly. Um, so let me ask one question of each of you. If, if there was one change 
that you would recommend to uh, a mindset, a, a specific mindset that someone needed, or for that matter, a specific activity that they would need to do to help develop business agility? Just one thing. What would be that one piece of advice that you would give them? Shane, do you want to start? I, I'm going to go with customer empathy. Pat? Meet people where they are. I'm going to go with uh, building a deeper self-awareness of how your own mental models and cognitive biases might be getting in your way and really hold yourself accountable for uh, that deepening awareness so that you can actually start acting in a more agile way, kind of believing. I think it just comes down to you need to deeply understand the value of what you're de what you're delivering. Not it's not the speed, it's not the the efficiencies, it's directly the value that that's being produced by the business. Okay, and then I would say that psychological safety would be the most important thing of everything to create that safe space for people to be able to feel good and perform well in our organizations that will create all the difference and here the leaders have to go first and show that they can make mistakes and be fallible. Last but not least, and not related to other that. than recruitment. <laughs> <laughs> and related to that, uh, I think we need to work on the system, not the people. All right. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, hang on. Yep. You can. So my question is around uh, we always stress on values. We Thank you. Hello. Yeah. My question is uh, we always stress on values a lot. That what value we are giving out of the system, uh, out of any framework which we are using. From your experiences, what all different aspects of values you consider are important? Like one example could be business value. What business value we are giving to our customer. Another could be knowledge. Knowledge is another value that out of the system, that what value is coming out of that. In that terms, what are the other aspects which you feel are part of values? What is valuable? Value is going to be in the eye of the beholder. And if you look at its stakeholder management and the ability to, to do effective sense making within the scope of your ecosystem, you really need to dig in and understand what are those, what are those people who are attracted to your business? Uh, what are the personas? Uh, what what do they, what what problems are they trying to solve, and are we a part of that, helping them to be able to get that stuff done? In immediate value uh, is also though different than brand value. Brand value is if I deliver it consistently, it'll be like Apple when they say, you know, if you go by an Apple store and there's people waiting in line, you ask them why you're waiting in line. It's just because they might release something new you know that's they've, they've produced enough value to the point where people trust that whatever that next thing is going to be I'm going to go wait in that line I'd say that uh, values are extremely personal and very individual and everybody has a different value structure and it comes from your basic uh, needs uh, you, basically your personality is shaping your value structure so it could be power it could be independence it could be um, that you value tranquility or any uh, such thing that is deeply personal to to uh, a certain person yeah, yeah and there's a Value and values are somewhat different. Value for the customer, for the stakeholders, uh, and, and it's sustainable value for the organization and for the customers and for the planet and the environment at, at one level, and then the values that the organization espouses and that the people in, the, in that organization exhibit. All right, let's stop there. I want to say thank you to the panelists and everyone who came up onto the stage.